Um, but she made space to come. And some of you have maybe come in here in a tough place, emotionally, spiritually, in your life. Maybe you've been serving God for so many years and you're just here out of habit. Or maybe you're here out of hunger. People are here for, for different reasons. But I think on this last session, it's important to remember that it's not too late to have a moment with God. And all it takes is one moment with God to change things in your life because your life changes when your heart changes. And so this morning in the short time, and I'm going to be short. I'm usually long-winded. I'm going to be short. First of all, I have a plane. Second of all, I intentionally did not use the bathroom and drink a lot of water so that if I needed a reminder, my bladder will kick in at some point because I have the bladder of a five-year-old. Um, but I, I promise not to be here long, but I want us to make it count um, by posturing our hearts and saying, God, maybe you still have one more thing that you want to say to me. I want to... Um, I'm not even going to pray over the word because, and it's so funny, when you go to preach and somebody, yeah, you forgot to pray. No, no, I prayed over this. I prayed over this morning, yesterday, day before. I've been praying over this. So if you didn't pray, that's on you. I prayed over this message. So don't judge me. We're going to go right into it. Um, there's so many things about the life of Abraham that would really preach well. Uh, if you've studied the life of Abraham, the father of our faith, I mean, there's so many things to think about that you could get up here and just preach so hard. You could talk about the fact how he left his country and the comforts of his home, and he obeyed God, and he went to a new place, and, and, and that's harder than you think. Trust me, I've done it before, and, you, and he just set out, and I could sit here and preach that, and, and we could all shout and scream. I could preach about how he obeyed God even more dramatically than that when he took his only son not his only son, his promised son, and walked him up a hill and was willing to sacrifice and give back to God the thing that he gave to him. And I could preach all day about how God requires the same thing of us, how everything that God gives to us is never really ours, and we have to always hold on to it loosely and be ready to offer it back to God because every gift you have, every talent, everything you have in your life is really a gift from God, and it's his. It's not yours. You're an owner of nothing and a steward of everything. I could preach on that, and we could be very inspired. I could, I could, I could preach about how when his body was as good as dead, he believed that God would do what he said he did, and he conceived, and this miracle child, and we could talk on and on about the covenant and how radical his faith was. If you want to know how radical his faith and his obedience and surrender was, just go to Hebrews chapter 11 and hear them just rave about him. Go on and on about how great and amazing Abraham was, the father of our faith, and most of his life preaches so well, except for there's a little part in there that's kind of messy. And I love this because the fact is between Moses, David, and Paul, they wrote most of the Bible. That means most of the Bible was written by murderers. And so every time that you think you're doing something, you're not, you're not quite up, you, you know what, you, God is like, the devil's like, you can't do that because you still got this little thing. You're like, yeah, well, I haven't murdered anyone lately. And God still used Paul, David, and Moses to instruct all of us. So all of these guys, when you start to do character studies, as soon as you can become enamored with their character, God exposes a part of them that you go, okay, okay, I can be, I can be enamored with their character here, but I, I don't want to be just like them because they have issues just like me. I want to be like Christ. And Abraham had a messy part in his story. And here's the funny part is that God could have kept that between him and Abraham. And God d decided in scripture that he was not going to delete that scene. He was not going to delete this scene from Abraham's story that forever and ever we were going to stand here and we're going to talk about his most embarrassing failure. He said, you know, I'm not going to delete that because I think the people need to know about your messiness because I need people to know that I, I do my best work in the dirt. I do my best work in the dirt, in the mess of people's life, just like when I, I, I created the whole world. But when I wanted to do my best work, I came down and I reached into the dirt and formed Adam. Just like when the woman was caught in adultery and I reached down and I put my finger in the dirt and wrote in the sand, God has always done his best work in the dirt. And so when Abraham's life gets messy and a little sticky, 
sometimes we can want to avoid it. I'm sure he wishes this was not left in the scene. This is the part that he wishes wasn't being preached. But I want to preach it today because I want us to be reminded of what God can do when, when God puts his finger and touches the dirtiest places of our life. In fact, one of my favorite, most encouraging verses in Scripture is in Hebrews 11. It was talking, going on and on about the great faith of the people in Hebrews 11. And it says this, whose weakness was turned to strength. Whew, Lord Jesus, I love that verse. It ministers to me. Because it's, it's telling you, yeah, they were strong, they were strong. But they were strong because I took their weakness and I turned it in to strength. So they're not above you. They are right there. And if you will offer your weakness to God, he can turn it to strength. And he, he turns around and says this about them. The world was not worthy of them. And so many of the people in that chapter made horrifying mistakes. And Abraham was no exception. Today I want to talk about the part of the story that he wishes got left out. We all know it. God had promised him a son. And he is the father of our faith, right? He's the, he's the, guy, he's the faith guy. And God has promised him a son through which all nations will be blessed, but it's been a long time and the promise hasn't been fulfilled. I don't know if you've ever been there. God makes you a promise, it hasn't been ful fulfilled, and you start to squirm. And this is what happens in Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 to 3, it says, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. And so she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. Go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Her suggestion. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. It's not, he didn't even fight that at all. He was supposed to at least be like, you know, that's not, okay, okay, <laughs> fine. It was just too easy. So a, after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. So Abraham has a promise from God, and Sarah suggests that they find another way to do it, and he agrees. Now, they had many, 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 many maidservants. Slaves in that day was not what we know in the Western world as slaves. Um, it was a very different scenario. So, so Hagar is, is one of many, many maidservants they have, and she is actually become one of the most trusted maidservants in the inner circle. Now, anyone in Abraham's camp, because of God's hand of provision and blessing, everyone attached to him is blessed. So his family is blessed, his servants are blessed. And so Hagar is living in the blessing of being connected to Abram, Abraham. And so she is one of many and somehow, she works her way enough to, out of all that they have to choose from, Sarah says, I think I pick Hagar. So, lay with Hagar, and maybe God will give us a son through her. I don't, I, I'm not great at math, but lay with her, he leaves, goes over with her, and maybe God will give us a son through her. The problem is that if it's not God's seed, it's not God's son. If something begins with you and not with God, then it's not God's problem. And God has no obligation to bless what begins with you and doesn't begin with him. So they decide that they're going to have this, they're going to do this their own way. It hasn't worked, and so maybe they need to help God. I know nobody ever has felt like you needed to help God before. Um, you know what, maybe I can just help God. He told me the end, and I can maybe help him figure out the beginning because he's, he's really running behind schedule. He's got a lot to do, so I'll help him. Well, they were right about one thing, and that is Hagar did conceive very easily. So now Abraham's probably thinking, wow, maybe the problem was always with Sarah and not with me because clearly I have no problem producing children. Um, so Hagar gets pregnant, and we learn that miracles are not marks of God's approval. They're marks of God's mercy. So not every miracle is a reward. <laughs> Sometimes it's just mercy because Ishmael is a miracle, but he's not a reward. He's God's mercy. So what they thought would, beginning, would be the beginning of their joy, we figured out a way. Now they celebrate Ishmael as the promised child. 
God fulfilled his promise. Here he is. And God's like, mm-mm, mm-mm, mm-mm. He's sitting up in heaven like, mm-mm, mm-mm. That's not, that's not it. But there on earth, him and everyone in their camp are celebrating Ishmael as the promised child. God did it. He responded. He gave us a child in our old age. And, and here he is. And the father of our faith, we see God so impatient waiting for the promise that he let Sarah talk him out of the process. Because when God makes you wait for a promise, there will always be opportunities for you to say, I want the promise, but I don't want the process. And so I'm going to find a way to try to make it happen on my own. Now we pick up in verse 3, it says, so after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. No issues. And when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And then Sarah said to Abraham, remember this was her idea, right? We, we all know the story. She looked at Abraham and said, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms. And now that she knows she is pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. God, deliver us from being women that always play the victim. You're not the victim and she says, your slave is in your hands. And Abraham said, or Abra- Abram, your slave is in your hands. Sarah, is, this is what Abraham says to her. She's in your hands. Do with her whatever you think best. Then Sarah mistreated Hagar. And so she fled from her. She runs away. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar... Slave of Sarah, where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, uh, she answered. Then the, the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant, and you will give birth to a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. Now, before we judge Hagar for being the illegitimate father of, or illegitimate mother of a promise and a fake promise, a plan B situation, before we judge her, can we just take a moment to acknowledge that Hagar is a human being? Just like Abram, just like Sarah, just like you, she's flawed. And she made a bad decision, but she was put in an impossible situation. There was not a whole lot of options for her. She's not an actress or a character on a TV. She's a person with a heart and with a soul, with feelings, with dreams, and with desires, and with secrets, on ambitions on the inside of her. And for a small window of time, she feels like she won the lottery. She goes from being just the slave and the maidservant to now the wife of Abraham. And for a moment, she starts to think, maybe my life won't always be as bad. Maybe this is the beginning of something beautiful. Maybe I can be more than just a slave. I'm going to be his wife. This is going to be amazing. I'm going to be the mother of the promise. And now I'm going to have maidservants working for me. My life has just gone up. And she doesn't know how to cope at this point because she had so much hope that maybe this was going to be something beautiful. And as soon as she, she starts to rejoice in it and realizes that she's pregnant, all the hopes and dreams that she had are just shattered. And she doesn't know how to cope. And so she runs away. How many times have you run away from memories? How many times have you run away from your feelings and just ignored them? How many times have you run away from your responsibilities? So don't judge my sister Hagar because she is a person just like you. And she does not know how to deal with the disappointment and with the devastation because after a life of oppression, she thought for a moment she would be more than just a maidservant. Maybe now she would be some, somebody. And then all of a sudden she says, now I'm worse off than when I began because now I'm about to be a single mother. I want you to imagine the emotions and the thoughts that are running through her head and through her heart as she starts to run away. Where am I running to? I have nothing. I have no one, no support. I want to feel her tears soaking the dust 
that's kicking up on her face. I want you to imagine the reality of her as she wanders, and she has never, ever felt so alone in her whole life. Maybe that's what, maybe some of you know what that feels like, because she is carrying something that's not designed to be carried alone. You're not supposed to be pregnant and alone. You're not supposed to have to process this and be alone. But now she has no support. She has no provision. And now she finds herself just wandering out in the wilderness. And I'm not sure where I'm going, but I can't handle being treated like I'm being treated back then. And it's in the moment that she feels the most alone that someone appears out of nowhere. Huh. And out of nowhere... Someone appears and she discovers that you are never as alone as you think. And that no matter how lost you feel, you are never beyond being found. She is out in a wilderness without a cell phone, without GPS, without absolutely anything or anyone. And she feels like she's never been more alone. And suddenly, in her isolated place, in her hiding place, in her place of sorrow, and being excruciatingly in pain inside, in that place, all of a sudden, she finds out that she's not as alone as she thought she was. And without identifying himself, this first, this being, identifies her. And he stops before saying, hey, let me introduce myself. He says, Hagar, servant of Sarah. In other words, I know who you are. I didn't just, you didn't just run into me. I found you. And then he reveals himself. He is the angel of God. He is actually God himself coming to meet the most likely person. Do you know how many people in this day would have died to have an encounter with God like this? Do you know how many men and women who would have given anything and everything to see God like this, to hear the voice of God, and he picks one person, a rejected and despised servant who is wandering around, feeling like she just lost everything, and all of a sudden, he appears to her, and he says, I know who you are, and with full knowledge of who you are, Hagar, I want to ask you two questions, and it's not questions that I need answered because I already know. It's questions that you need to stop and ask yourself. And he says this, Hagar, where have you come from? And where are you going? God stops everything to come and asks her just these two questions. What is the significance of these two questions? Where have you come from? Well, you know that I'm her servant, so you know I came from her camp. You know where I, no, 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 Hagar, I need you to ask yourself, where have you come from? And where are you going? Early in my ministry, I preached this um, passage a lot. I preached about Hagar so much. And then I had put the, the message aside for many years. And when I moved to Dallas several years ago, a few years ago, and was in a place where I was sort of kind of wondering where God was. <laughs> and I went on a Saturday night to a church that was not mine. I just needed an extra service because I needed to just like, you know, you know, sometimes you just need a little additional. So I found a church that has a Saturday night. And I went Saturday and there was a Jewish rabbi. And never in all of my ministry I have preached about Hagar since I was a teenager. And I have never, ever heard anyone else preach about her, anything like this. And this rabbi had the nerve to get, I thought he stole my notes. He got up there, he was a Jewish rabbi, and he preached almost, and I felt it was eerie. I felt like this is bizarre. I have never, and it's like so much of everything he's saying is everything I preached about this message. And in that moment, I felt like Hagar in the wilderness. And just for this moment, God was like, yeah, I just want you to know that I see you. And you feel lost, but I haven't lost you. And as I sat there listening, this rabbi uncovered another layer that I had missed when I had preached this as a youth. And it's this. So Hagar, it says she's an Egyptian, she's an Egyptian maidservant. Where did she come from? 
Do you remember the other embarrassing part of Abraham's story? Where they go somewhere, and he's afraid that um, the king is going like, yeah, you remember that one? Where he calls his wife his sister, that other one that he wishes was left out of the scripture. So he tells the king that his sister, or that his wife is his sister. And then the king, because his wife is beautiful, drop dead gorgeous, even as an old lady. So, I mean, the Bible says that it was true. So she's this old lady, but she's so beautiful. He's like, I know the king is going to, you know, want her. He wants her. He's like, this is my sister. And so the king is going to lay with her. He's going to take Sarah. And God comes to the king and is like, don't you lay a hand on her. And he's like, what? That's Abraham's wife. So the king comes to Abraham and he's like, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me this was your wife? I can't, I can't just take her and you know what? Here, take an offering, take all this, take all this. And you know what else? He round up some of my maidservants and take my maidservants too. And Hagar is one of the servants that is given to Abraham in this moment. So Hagar begins in Egypt, in a land of bondage, a land of godlessness, a land where there is no blessing. Her life starts out in Egypt, and now she is in this place. So, so God isn't just asking her, where have you come from, from their camp. He's asking her to remember, where have I brought you from? And he is reminding Hagar, you're running away, but do you not remember where you really came from? Do you not remember that you came from Egypt? And then he says, where? are you going? And the reality is that where he found her, and this is what this Jewish rabbi blessed me with, she was actually on her way back to Egypt. In other words, are you really going to go back? Do you remember what it was like there? Do you even remember? And he stops her and makes her remember, do you remember where I have brought you from? Do you really want to go back there? And then he tells her, you got to go back. And I know it hurts because there are always consequences to bad decisions that God doesn't cause, but they're just real. And if you, if you try to run away from them, you'll find yourself in more pain. And so he tells her, you have to go back and submit to her. And I love it in this moment is one of the, my favorite things, this angel who was God. And comes to her and he promises, look, you made a mess, but I'm still going to bless it. God in his mercy, he doesn't have to do it. He's, I'm still going to bless Ishmael. I'm still going to bless your descendants. I'm still going to bless it, but you do have to go back. And she says this about God. There's a lot of names for God in the Bible. But one of his names is given to him by an Egyptian maidservant named Hagar. And she gives him another name. She says all the other names that you've had. Don't describe and express what I have experienced right now in this moment. I have a new name for you. You are the God who sees. And she names him the God who sees because she found in the moment that she felt most lost that God had never lost sight of her. And he was the God who saw her right where she was. So she returns and she goes back home. And she gives birth to Ishmael. And when Ishmael's born, again, it seems like this is going to be not so bad because everyone acknowledges and celebrates him as the promised child. For years, for years, she starts to live like she's not the maidservant. She's Abram's other wife, the mother of the blessed child, the mother of the blessing that God promised. And she lives like this not for a few months, and not for a year, few years, but about 14 years, she lives acknowledging herself as the mother of the blessing. And then God interrupts and he comes to Abraham and says, you know how you tried to do it your own way because it wasn't my timing? Well, the time is now. And Sarah is going to be pregnant and she's going to give birth. And yes, you're going to be 100 years old. And that's part of what is going to make it a miracle. So the blessing is now coming. And so now that's great news for Sarah, but it's terrible news for Hagar. Again, Genesis chapter 21, Sarah saw. This is after um, Sarah gives birth. 
and Isaac is a couple years old. It says, Sarah saw that the son who Hagar the Egyptian had born to Abram was mocking her son. So, you know, Ishmael's a teenager, and he's sort of like making fun of a toddler. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal. But it was to Sarah. And she said to Abram, expel that slave woman and her son. For the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son Isaac. <clears throat> now this matter distressed Abram greatly because it concerned his son Ishmael. But God said to Abram, do not be distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to everything that Sarah tells you. For through Isaac your offspring will be reckoned. But I will also make a nation of the slave <coughs> woman's son because he is your offspring. Early in the morning, Abram got up. Now, I want you to just use your imagination, even if you need to close your eyes. Don't fall asleep, but I want you to just picture this. Early in the morning, Abram got up. This is the son who he has fathered for 13, 14 years. He's bonded with him. He's, he loves him. Ishmael is his son. Early in the morning, Abram got up. He took bread and a skin of water, and he put them on Hagar's shoulders, and he sent her away with the boy wonder what that goodbye was like. And she left, and she wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. And when the water in the skin was gone, she left the boy under one of the bushes. And then she went off and sat down nearby, about a bow shot away, for she said, I cannot bear to watch the boy die. And as she sat nearby, she lifted up her voice and wept. Then God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. What is wrong, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he lies. Get up, lift up the boy, and take him by the hand, for I will make him into a great nation. And then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water, so she went and filled the skin with water, and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy, and he grew up, and he settled in the wilderness and became a great archer. So Isaac is two or three. Ishmael is mocking him. Sarah sends them away. A teenager whose life has just been ripped from him. 13, 14 years, I go from being like the one everyone's looking at, like, that's the one, that's the one, to now I have to watch my mom carry this stuff on her back, walk me around this wilderness, and we've got nowhere to go, and the food is getting lower, and the water is getting lower, and he sent us away with some supplies, but it's almost gone. And it gets to the point where it is so desperate that not only has his life been taken from him, but now literally his life is about to slip away. He has been without food and water long enough that he is about to to die. And Hagar takes him and sits him under a bench. And again, she leaves him. And she comes over here because it is so sure that he's going to die that she says, I've been through enough. And it's bad enough that I'm going to have to figure out a way to bury my son out here in the wilderness and find a way to go on with my life. If I survive, I'll die soon after him. It's bad enough that he's going to die but I cannot bear to watch him die. And so she comes to another place, and he's crying over here somewhere, a teenage boy crying, and she's weeping and crying over here. I don't know whether or not they could hear each other, but the Bible lets us know that God heard them both. And he comes, the God who sees, this time he doesn't come, in a way she could see, because God doesn't always show himself the same way to you. And this time, she can't see him, but she hears him. And he says, hey, God, what's wrong? And he says, I've heard the cry of your son. I have heard what you thought no one else could hear. And it is in this experience that she finds that the, the God who sees is also the God who hears. 
He's the God who hears your cries, and he's also the God who hears your unspoken cries. He, he's the God who hears the things that you haven't even been able to find words to articulate or express. He is the God who sees you right where you are, and he's the God who hears you. He hears the cries of your soul. And she sa he says to her, I have heard your son, which means... I don't know if you know this, Hagar, or not, where, from where you're sitting, but he's still alive. If I can hear his voice, he's still alive. Get up, because the thing that you thought was probably dead, all right, and you're over here grieving it, and the truth is he's not dead yet, and I'm not done yet. I heard his cries, like a cry of a baby when they're first born that lets you know that they're breathing. That cry, that cry of sorrow was actually the way you could know he's still alive. So he says, go back. The thing you thought was dead or almost dead is actually alive. It's not over, Hagar. I know you thought it was all over, but there's still more. There's still, and I want to tell somebody in here today that it's not over, that it's not the end, that there is still more that God has heard, that God has seen, and you have come in this place. Maybe some of you, all you needed to know and be reminded of is that God sees you and that God hears you. And for some of you, the thing that you have given up on, God says, I haven't. Maybe it's a dream. I don't know what it is, but God has come to say it's not dead yet. And he says, get up, Hagar, and go to him and take him by the hand. And when it feels like it's over, just like the first time, God shows himself to her in a new way. And he opens her eyes to see a well that was right there. God sometimes will come and show you that right in front of you has been the thing that you really need. Did he cause a well to appear or did he just open up her eyes to see something that was already there? I don't know. But God comes and says there's provision. There's something there for her. And so as I close this morning, I want to I just remind you that wherever you are in your life right now. You came here to try to find God, but God never lost you. God saw you in your home before you got on a, in a car or on a plane. And God saw you with a pillow over your face crying into it. And God saw you the tears that you tried to hide from your children so you could look strong. And God saw you in the bathroom and in the shower crying. And God saw you and he heard you. And you didn't have to come here to find him, but you did come here. And so he refuses to let you leave here without the knowledge that he has always seen you, that he is the God who sees and that he is the God who hears. So before I pray and just close, I want to leave you with some homework. When you go home, I want you to sit down and make a quiet place. And I want you to write down two questions before God and answer these two questions. The same questions that God asked of Hagar. Where have you come from? And where are you going? Sometimes the biggest problem is that we've actually forgotten. It's so easy to forget the places God's brought you from. In the middle of your wilderness season, especially when you feel so much weight in the now, you lose sight of where you could have been. And I want us, from the youngest to the oldest, especially the oldest, who might have just been, now you're just going through the motions. And God is like, no, you're here for a reason still. I want to refresh and stir something up in you again. Sit down with your little cup of tea or whatever it is and get a notebook and maybe play some worship music and just ask God, help me answer these questions. Where have you, remind me, Holy Spirit, of where you brought me from and just begin to write without overthinking it. 
because the enemy will come in and start making you question just right without overthinking it this is just between you and God where have you come from and you're going to have to struggle at first you're going to be like oh I don't know where to begin and once I promise you once you start writing you're not going to even hardly be able to stop the Holy Spirit is just going to start reminding you things over and over over again and when you get done with that I want you to turn a page and a new question where are you going why is this? Because sometimes when you're wandering, I do this even in a mall. I don't know about you. I walk into a store, and I walk out, and I don't remember which direction I came in. I, I'm, maybe I'm the only one. I just I get disoriented. I lose my sense of direction, and I don't know if, like, I was. did I start this way, and I need to turn this way? Or did I start this way, and I have to start just walking? Like, wait, you know what? I already passed this. Didn't I? Didn't I? I'm trying to walk this way. Because it's disorienting, and sometimes in life, life can do the same thing for you. And you're still alive, and you're still going, and you're still serving God, but you don't have any real sense of direction. And you have to stop and ask yourself and be honest, where am I going? The things that I'm doing in my life, what direction are they taking me? Do I have vision? Do I have an idea? Are the things, the way I'm living, is it taking me back? Because God, you know, I had a season in my life that was hard, and then, God, I just, I feel like he revived everything, and he stirred me up, and I was in a great place, and I was in a great place. And am I still in that place? Am I still in that sensitive place to God where I can hear him? Or have I solely just drifted? Or am, am I moving backwards, or am I moving forwards? Where are you going? Where have you come from? And where are you going? That's your homework. Are you ready for homework? Can you do that when you get home? Because I believe that God has met us in this place. For some of you, just as a reminder, some of you, this is that wilderness for you. And God has come just to remind you, I see you on the back row, on the front row, in the middle, out in the lobby, that I see you right where you are. He is the God who sees and he is the God who hears. Before Sister Nikki comes back, could you bow your heads and just pray with me? Father, I thank you of the privilege, for the privilege of just standing before these beautiful women who are your daughters, who you love. And most of them are women that I don't know personally, but I stand as your messenger because you do know them personally. You know every detail of their life. God, you know exactly where they are. You know the prayers that they have been praying. You know the wandering. You know how tired and exhausted and weary they are. You know how lost some of them feel. And so I'm asking you, Lord, in Jesus' name, in this moment, that they would sense your nearness and that they would be reminded that, God, you see them and, God, you hear them. And God, even if they have made a mess, you will still lay your hand on it and bless it. That you will bless even their worst mistakes, that you still have a future, that you still aren't done. I pray for some people who have given up, maybe on the call of God on their life, maybe on dreams that they had. Maybe they've given up in their spiritual walk and just settled wherever they are. God, I pray that you would remind them that it's not over, that you're not done that you still have more for them. God, I pray that when they walk out of this place, that something that was said in the sessions that they've sat through, God, would resonate in their hearts and would take them, give them courage to face the next level, give them courage to fight the next battle, give them vision to cast in their home. God, give them the passion that they need to get up and to seek you again and to love you again and to find you again and to serve you again and to offer their gifts to you again and to offer their life to you again. I thank you, God, that the enemy's lie is being broken off their life, that lie that you are done in their life, that you are done with them, or that it's too late. I thank you that it's broken off their life in Jesus' name. And I declare that these women walk out of here not the same, with a new sensitivity to you, a new understanding of you, a new revelation of you. Maybe for some you had always been just the God who sees, but today you're the God who hears. A new revelation. I pray a new hunger to be stirred up, a new passion inside of them to serve you. God, a new conviction, a new fear of the Lord, a new, new level for all of them. I pray that they would not leave this place the same in Jesus' name.
If you believe it, say amen. amen. I love you guys. Thank you so much for coming, for listening to me. I love you. Thank you. I appreciate you guys. He knows where you're at, doesn't he? You can't get away from the Lord. It has been our intention to uh, pour into you this uh, retreat time that we've had together so that when you go from here, like she said, you will be empowered and you will be able to be used of the Lord in a mighty way and realize that he has great things for you no matter where you're at, what condition that you're in. He wants you to go in his strength and his power and be used of him. And we're so glad that you have been with us. And let us just stand at this time. And we're going to just have a word of prayer. We're going to uh, uh, dismiss you. <clears throat> but I do want to remind you that uh, the sessions has been recorded. And after a time, we'll give them a little bit of time to get it on our website. If you, <clears throat> I, I challenge you to uh, get some ladies together, either in your home or at your church or the ladies that didn't get to come, and play these sessions and, and have a time of uh, ministering to one another and let this word minister to them. So uh, you... I, I'm sure you know someone that was unfortunate and didn't get to come that you can share with. Several of our churches that uh, haven't got to come, maybe there was a distance away. They've told me, Sister McGee, I had a night, and I just said, this is our women's night. This is where our women's meeting, and they played those the videos for the girls, and and there and the ministry continued on and continued on bless their heart, and they didn't feel like they were cheated because they didn't get to come, and yet <coughs> God continues. The word goes on and on and on. <coughs> and once again, let's give it up for Katie and give her a wonderful hand for coming. She gave us everything that was within her, what the Lord had to say to us, and the hours and the hours of study that she puts into it, um, we just appreciate her so much. And knowing that she has to also speak tomorrow two times and uh, in her church that she goes to. Now, tell me again, what's the name of your church? Embassy City Church in Irving, Texas. And you live in Denton? What is it? Part, uh, outskirts of Dallas, yes. And so we're honored that she took time and come to be with us. Let's once again give it up for our worship team. <laughs> yes, they did an awesome job. <clears throat> Thank you. And we're just, uh, like I said again, we're honored that you're here. And <clears throat> we'll have the dates out shortly for the next one and where it's going to be. And so be watching, and next year you'll want to invite someone else and bring them, and, and we'll have a bigger place that we can just uh, uh, house everybody. And we just want to thank you again, and now let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we're just so grateful for what you have done this in this meeting. Lord, we come with hungry hearts, and we've been fed. And now, Lord, we feel that you have strengthened us, you have anointed us. You have empowered us in a way that we can go and we can be used mightily of you because of the word that we heard, because of your challenging our hearts. We pray that you would go with us and we pray that you would give traveling mercy upon all those that are traveling today. And we pray that you would just uh, help us to be able to get all the girls to the airport in time, and we give you praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, be sure to tell the people that <coughs> you see from the church here, thank them for their hospitality and how they've done a wonderful job uh, housing this meeting. <laughs>